Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe, the host of this great show of ours. Uh, please, if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe uh, at the button there. We, we always welcome new viewers. Our objective is to enthuse, energize and, and empower uh, viewers, obviously with life-changing information. And today we're going to talk about risk and risk management. And we have uh, none other than an expert auditor. Uh, who is also an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur at the same time, Mr. Khumolemo uh, Tsutledi. Mr. Tsutledi, welcome to the studio. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Would you care to tell the viewers who you are, share a little bit of a background, tell them what you do for a living? Okay. Mm. Uh, like you have already alluded, I'm Khumolemo Tsutledi. I'm currently the managing director of GOMS Advisory Services, where we provide uh, services on internal audit. Uh, enterprise risk management uh, training as well as corporate services. Corporate services meaning consultancy. Okay. Yes. Share on your academic background and training. Uh, I have a, a degree in accounting. Mm -hmm. I also have a qualification on enterprise risk management. Mm -hmm. I did some several courses, especially uh, compliance, related to compliance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and uh, you're also an auditor? Yes, sir. I'm okay. an auditor, internal auditor. Okay, <laughs> all right. And member of BICA as well? Member of Institute of Internal Auditors. Okay. Yes. We're here to talk about risk and risk management. What's your definition of risk? Uh, risk or risk management is a very broad subject. Mm. So if I can define risk, is the possibility of an event uh, occurring uh, but you don't know the outcome. It can be a positive, result in a positive or a negative outcome. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we, we said it's a possibility, you are not sure about the event happening. Okay. Is it a, a concept based on statistics, that the statistics of this happening are equal to this and you calculate based on that? Yes, it's a broad subject. Uh, it can include a quantitative, mm. can be quantitative, semi-quantitative, or qualitative. Mm -hmm. Yes, but in enterprise risk management, it's mainly quality. I mean, semi-qualitative and qualitative. Okay. Yes. Um, and and in Botswana, when we talk of ent and enterprise risk management, what are you talking about exactly? Enterprise risk management uh, is related to achievement of goals. Mm -hmm. The main aim here is that you want to achieve, you increase the likelihood of achieving your goals. Mm -hmm. Like if I can describe enterprise risk management, it's a process. You don't do it in a haphazard manner. It's a process, a systematic process, whereby you identify uh, the risk, uh, or the events that are affecting your organizations, uh, you respond to them. After mm -hmm. identifying them, you also evaluate and respond to them. Then you continue to monitor uh, that process as time goes on. It includes monitoring and review, as well as communication and consultation. Mm -hmm. As you do that process, you communicate and consult across all the structures of the organization. What is the biggest risk facing entrepreneurs as they start their business? Uh, the biggest risk, uh, it, it depends. It depends on the, the environment mm. or the, the, the context or the type of business they are, they are doing. For example, I can give you an example. At the moment, we know we are faced by COVID. Mm. Then COVID, but COVID affects everybody. It doesn't matter what kind of environment you are, mm. but COVID uh, affects uh, everybody. 
Uh, another risk in most of the businesses can be liquidity risk mm -hmm. or the going concern. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to manage those kind of risk as we continue to venture into several kind of businesses. But the, the most important thing, you have to understand your, your context mm. or environment. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about just an average startup. Let's say you are involved in e-commerce, for instance. Um, what going concern risk are you facing when you start an e-commerce enterprise? Uh, when you start that kind of business, uh, the, the main thing is that you have to know that uh, is your business going to be viable or do you have uh, customers for those businesses or those who are interested in your, in your business? Then you assess the markets and all sorts of things. Then you should know that uh, the likelihood of achieving your objectives, are they very high? Mm. They should be, you should be assured that you're going to achieve your objectives as you venture in that kind of business. Mm. Mm. What tools do you employ in, in evaluating risk? In other words, how do you go about evaluating risk? Uh, you can evaluate risk in enterprise risk management. Uh, you should know the impact. Mm -hmm. Yes, if it occurs, uh, uh, is, is it catastrophic or serious or whatever. Then you should also know the likelihood. That's why it is measured in likelihood times impact. Mm -hmm. For example, if I say, you do a scale of one to five in likelihood, then one to five on impact. You can easily multiply both. Let's say if in likelihood you got three and in impact you got five, it's three times five. Mm. That's what we call the risk matrix. Then you get 15 as an example. Then after getting uh, that product, now you prioritize. You'll be doing that for almost all of your, your risks then you can analyze them, then prioritize them in terms of severity. Okay, uh, entrepreneurs are very practical people. The theory is very, very nice, but can you talk about a particular company you did uh, assess risk in without necessarily mentioning names, but just to give us an idea of this company was involved in X, Y business, and I did ABC, and this is how we arrived at uh, these results. Uh, let me give an example of a uh, of petroleum I industry mm -hmm. uh, related to COVID. You know, uh, last was it last you year? Mean like a petrol station. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, they have they had challenges of supply, mm -hmm. so that was a risk to the businesses because they couldn't make enough revenue for for that for that period. Mm -hmm. So that's the risk they had to manage. They had to manage to make sure that they have adequate supply mm -hmm. or intervention of other stakeholders so that there's adequate supply for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. yes. So how does someone like you come in and what are the deliverables for an expert like you in an organization like that? Uh, first of all, uh, when you do enterprise risk management, you have to look at the vision of the organization. Then from the vision, there's the mission statement. Mm -hmm. Then out of those, you have the objectives. So you start by assessing the environment of that business, then you look at the objectives. What do they want to achieve? Mm. Then you assess the risk associated with those objectives and help them to, to, to mitigate mm -hmm. those risks. Okay. Mm. Just how, can you, I just want to take you back to your career to understand what specific steps or courses you did to become a risk management expert. Just share with us your life's journey and how you ended up even opening your own business. I think people would be really interested to know your own personal experience insofar as dealing with various risks and actually uh, maneuvering your way through and getting to where you are. It's all, sometimes it's all about passion. Uh, even though it was part of my career, uh, like the, the qualifications, I, I did accounting in yes. general, but when I get into the profession, uh, I was fortunate enough to do internal audit, then we, we had to also cover the area of risk management. Mm -hmm. So this area is so interesting because you also deal with strategy to help uh, the, the organizations to plan forward or achieve their objectives. Mm -hmm. Yes. So your journey? Uh, my journey, uh, I've been internal auditor in a pub, public 
service, mm. uh, then parastatal. I also worked as a project officer uh, in one of the commercial banks, whereby you can also address uh, some, some queries or any other risk related to customer service. Mm -hmm. Yes. You are the immediate past president of JCI uh, International, which is Chamber, Junior Chamber of Commerce International. Um, what organization is that, and how has that organization helped you to get where you are? Uh, JCI, which is Junior Chamber International, uh, yes, I'm part of it, that, 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 that's true. Uh, I've served in several positions in JCI uh, as the treasurer in the national board, uh, as the local president at the local level, uh, vice president up to the president that mm -hmm. currently I'm the immediate past president. I'm also the development officer for Af JCI African and Middle East. So the objective of JCI is simple, is to provide development opportunities that empowers young people to create positive change. How do they create positive change? They do that by doing sustainable projects. We do sustainable projects by following, there's a framework, it's called ACF, Active Citizen. Active? Active Citizenship Framework. Mm -hmm. okay, so you use that framework uh, to make sure that uh, you address the root cause of the problem mm -hmm. in a certain environment and create that positive change. And how did you make it to president? It must have been tough. <laughs> Uh, to president, uh, it's all about uh, whether people trust you or because of the, uh, your, your service in various positions, do they trust you? Because the elections, the, the elections also, you have to campaign and you have to, say, to, to tell the, the people or the audience uh, your reason for wanting to be in that position. So to share your through vision. that process, yes. Mm. So I was elected then being able to go up the ladder in several positions. You guys made me your patron and I'm very proud of being a patron of JCI and you do come to Nona's to our restaurant every now and then. I'm very happy about that. But I think not enough people know what JCI can do for them. So perhaps you could use your own life story to say JCI has specifically done A, B, C, D for me and these are the results. Uh, JCI has empowered me, has empowered me uh, in personal development. In JCI, there are a series of courses, uh, for example, project management, uh, parliamentary procedures, how to, to, to run a meeting. So, so many courses in JCI website, they are there. So they develop me as well as to interact with other stakeholders because we deal with several stakeholders. Uh, how, how do you interact or network? Mm -hmm. as well as how do you carry out projects. You know, projects has a timeline, the different areas to be followed in a project. So mm -hmm. those different are the deliverables. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things that uh, JCI helped me with. So to, to develop personally, as well as by going through the several courses. And currently, what big projects is JCI working on? Uh, currently, because of COVID, uh, I, I wouldn't say there are such big projects, but it, uh, recently we did tree planting uh, in Lubatet Athlon. What does that mean, uh, tree planting? Uh, okay, let me start it there. Our mission in JCI are related to sustainable development goals. So whatever we do, we have to align to those uh, SDIs. SDIs, yes. Mm. So we are SDGs, sorry. SDGs. Mm. We are dealing with conserving the, the environment. Mm. Yes. The other one is education. Uh, we have previously partnered with uh, the Zyke Construction uh, to build uh, the daycare center in Khabron West. Wow. So as part of the education to empower the young, ch the, I mean the, the young kids in that community, mm. so, so that they can get uh, the privilege of. Getting so what did you say you were doing at Athlon? At Athlon it was tree planting. Or oh, tree planting? Yes. So how many oh. trees you planted? I can't remember, but there, there are several of them. Okay. There are several of them and we're still taking care of them. Okay. Yes. All right. And now we go back to risk. Uh, how do you respond yourself to risk? Either uh, you or your company? 
Okay. Companies or organizations or even individuals, how do you respond to risk? There are different strategies. Uh, it depends on the magnitude of that risk. If it's a severe risk, you also measure it with the outcome. Mm -hmm. If you respond to it, what will be the outcome as well? For example, you want to, to carry out a project which will, which will cost you a lot of billions, but in terms of uh, outcome, it won't deliver much, so you can avoid. So mm -hmm. avoidance is one of the strategy. So you can also choose to mitigate the risk with the internal controls that you have. You can re reduce the level of risk, yes, or you can transfer. Mm -hmm. Transfer Example of transferring risk can be transferring to third party like insurance companies or outsourcing one of the services which you cannot manage properly. Mm. Mm. I've heard people argue that uh, risk is in fact a good thing and that risk should be embraced. What is your take? Like when I started uh, in the definition of risk, it, it can result in a either positive or negative outcome. So the one which is related to positive outcome is mainly related to the stock exchange, uh, as an example, when you want to invest in shares or bonds or whatever. So that one, the, the possibility of uh, getting a better outcome, there's a chance for that. Mm. But there's another type of risk, which is hazard risk. Mm. That one is, is always negative, so there's no chance of getting uh, the best outcome out for of example? it. For example? For example, safety and health, uh, environment, the, the things which you do. Mm. Uh, injuries, uh, floods, you know, if, it, if there are floods, you know, some other companies don't, will not get uh, adequate uh, supply in terms of, for example, raw material, mm. if you are a processing company. Okay. Why is risk management important, I mean, uh, in, in strategic management? Risk management, I can say, is very, very crucial in strategic management because uh, you have to start with the vision of the, of the organization. Where does it want to go? Or the company. Mm -hmm. Then you, it's the mission, then the objective. The most critical thing is the achievement of the objectives. So when you manage the risks, you are increasing the likelihood of achieving your objectives. You can make sure that uh, there are adequate internal controls. I can give you an example of internal controls like supervision. There's enough supervision, mm. uh, there's segregation of duties, uh, or balance and checks here and there, so that somebody can check other processes before they pass on to another stage. You mentioned segregation of duties, and for a lot of entrepreneurs when they are starting, they will say they can't afford the luxury of employing too many people. So can you balance that uh, problem of inadequate funding for getting too many employees versus the risk involved when you don't segregate duties. Can you help them understand the, 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 the pros and cons of the two sides of the argument? Yes, the, that one is debatable because at the time of COVID, you will you, you'll find that most of the companies uh, don't want to employ more people. So the trimming or downsizing. Mm. So, but the most critical thing is that you shouldn't compromise uh, your processes mm -hmm. for example it can lead to fraud for example in accounts payable you know there is somebody who does the requisition uh, another one does the the purchase order preparation another one receives the goods when they come in then another another one pays so you can see that that that, that cycle is very very critical you should also look at the the benefits mm -hmm. to the organization is very very critical you can't you can't compromise it even though you want to downsize in the in the company mm. Mm. so you have to segregate yes you have to segregate mm. so that you you you, you, you do things properly there a lot of companies have talked about pilfering pilferage or in in their companies thefts and so on how do you mitigate against that risk mm, the issue of theft i would say it depends on the the risk appetite, I'll talk about it, the risk appetite of the company. For example, uh, if you are a processing company, let's say you process, it's food processing or whatever. So you look at the, you have to consider at the value of your assets. Uh, and also, how do you manage risk related to it? I can give you an example. If you have a bookstore, uh, it's very, very simple. You just need a, 
in your, in your store, we just need lock and key. Then maybe security. Mm. It's not that a, a lot of investment. But where, let's say I can give you an example, diamonds, you know, they are, valu they are valuable. Mm. So in that kind of environment, you have to invest more in, in your internal controls and mm. also in your security risk management mm. processes. So, so um, do, do what, 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 in your experience as an auditor, companies that have suffered theft, loss of money, loss of resources, have failed to mitigate their risk in what fashion? In other words, where are the, uh, the weaknesses in such companies? Uh, the, the, there are so many weaknesses, but uh, I, I can't go much <laughs> into detail. But for example, we know the, the Enron scandal. Yes. Yes, there are so many scandals around the world. So if companies don't invest much in their internal controls, mm. uh, it can result... What happened in Enron? Where was the failure there? Ah, <laughs> they, they were not uh, adequate controls, like misappropriation, I can say misappropriation of funds. Mm. Or the I think this, they kept uh, hyping up the, the, the stock value yes, to yes. the point where it, it crashed and there was no substance behind the hype, yes. as I recall. Yes. Mm. Oh. So in Botswana, have you seen such similar scandalous situations? In Botswana... And can you share your experience? I can't say I've seen such uh, scandals, but you can hear the, the news, or you can see in, in the newspaper here and there. Uh, but uh, let, let me give you an example of governance. I don't want to talk about the names of the, the organizations or companies. Mm. You'll find that things were not done right within the company, whereby the board members or management end up uh, leaving the companies because they had uh, some funny business or, or whatever, fraud. They can call it fraud. So yeah. I won't mention the names. I'm no, sorry you can't. About that. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. We know the recent cases uh, where it, affects, it affected the, some of the board members, mm. where they ended up, the board members ended up going. Okay. Yes. Um, let me also ask you about uh, internal auditors. Generally, it's easy to convince someone uh, of the importance of an external auditor who comes in and does the books. But you seem to be of the view that we need internal auditors. First of all, what's the job of an internal auditor and why do you think internal auditors are needed to manage risk? Uh, internal auditing, you know, broad subjects, uh, their objective is to add value. Uh, they are employees of the, the company. Mm. That's why they are called internal auditors. They add value in the processes of the organization uh, by giving an assurance either to the board or to management regarding the achievement of the objectives. Uh, in risk management, where, where do they come in? Uh, they do risk-based mm. uh, internal audit plans. So when they do risk-based mm. internal audit plans, mm. uh, they are taking consideration of the risk which are facing the organization by prioritizing them including them in their plans, then they audit, uh, they get the findings, then they recommend. Mm. So internal auditors' recommendations are very crucial because uh, if management implement them, uh, they increase the likelihood of achieving organizational objectives. Hence, mm. they will be dealing with uh, the risks that are facing the organization. So the, does the internal auditor work side by side with, uh, with, with, the, with the accountant? Uh, internal audit, first of all, is an independent uh, function. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't work together, but it's an independent. But they keep on assessing uh, the processes uh, across the organization, including uh, the accounting function or finance mm -hmm. function. Okay. Uh, they assess. We know the external auditor comes and uh, they do the, the audits, financial audits on account. But, uh, the difference between them and internal audit is that it's based there. You keep on providing assurance continuously on the uh, achievement of the organization's uh, objectives. Okay. Um, I've heard of things like King 1, King 2, King 3. Are you familiar with those things and what are they? Uh, those are governance frameworks. Mm. Uh, they have different models. There's King 3. Uh, there is COVID, there is COSO framework, the governance framework whereby 
uh, they have to be implemented by the organization's management. But the board has to set the tone at the top. Mm -hmm. It has to come from the board, then management, then it falls down to, it trickles down to the, the lower staff. But the culture, as, as management or the board, we have to inculcate that culture mm -hmm. of compliance across the, the organization. And do, do any of those uh, structures, king, one up to whatever number, deal with risk and how so? Yes, they deal with risk because they have uh, different components uh, related to the risk management. We're mm -hmm. starting from identification of risk, uh, evaluation, then monitoring and review as well as communication uh, across all the structure of the organization. So which companies, do, do, do you recommend that all companies should adopt those models? Yes, but the, uh, it depends on them which model they, they want to choose, looking at the, the context of uh, the Is it not just the, the same model being updated every now and then, or it's different? Yes, they are updated, but uh, the companies can choose that model. For example, they, they can, we know the familiar one is the, the King Code of uh, Governance. Mm. So it depends on which model does the company want to adopt. Mm. Yes. And most of them do give guidelines as to how uh, management should deal with risk and how the board interacts with management on the issue of risk. Yes, uh, the, the, the guidelines uh, in those kind of frameworks. In each and every stage, uh, it's detailed on how to, 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 to go about it or to comply with that particular framework. In any given organization, who do you say is responsible for management of risk, for risk management? Risk management is a very, very crucial subject. So it is a responsibility of all, starting from the board, mm. who they set the tone at the top, uh, executive management, middle management, until uh, the lower officers. So it's the responsibility of everybody in the organization to manage the risk. Okay. So you have to develop that culture that even if you can come to the cleaner and ask her or him about the uh, risk management. It, it should be easy for her or him mm. uh, to, to explain. Or mm. whether maybe come and ask uh, what is a risk in your, your area. Uh, she should be able to tell you that uh, safety and health is, is a risk because she will be dealing with chemicals, the floors are wet, so he should direct the employees how to, to, mm. to, where to pass so that they cannot result in injuries. It's just an example. Uh, in manufacturing, people deal with uh, different machineries. So they should know also them. That's why I say it's a responsibility of almost each and everyone in the organization. So let me ask you then in, in terms of uh, how risk should be approached by all organizations. Are you advising organizations to invite external experts, people like you, come and train on risk or do you believe that uh, um, it is something that just evolves in any organization? In other words, are there any interventions that you recommend? Yes, uh, I think organizations uh, should take uh, risk management very, very seriously because it helps them, it gives them the high likelihood of achieving the organizational values because uh, it, it, it's embedded, it should be embedded into the, the strategy. So it, it cannot be separated uh, because the, the main focus of the organization is to achieve mm -hmm. its goals. So if you, you, you embed in uh, risk management processes, so th 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 there's high likelihood of... How do you then achieving. inculcate it, like you said, as far as the cleaner, how do you inculcate okay. that, the, the culture? I can give an example. The, in, enterprise risk management, the different structures. Mm -hmm. In enterprise risk management framework, they say what is called a framework where it explains everything and whose responsibility is, the, is it to do whatever job regarding risk management. For example, the risk champions, they should be risk champions within the organization who work with management and who work with uh, the, the lower staff the a coordination. So they keep on uh, consultation, consulting and uh, providing feedback to, to others. 
what I mean is that they take information from the lower staff, uh, they, then they recommend to management. Also, they get feedback from management to the lower staff. So everybody should be brought on board. So how do you identify a, a risk champion in an organization? Uh, or how do you create one? How do we create one? The, the first thing is, is training. Mm -hmm. They have to train, but you look at the capability of an individual. You have to train. You train them. They have to understand what is risk, what is enterprise risk management. Then you train them. Then uh, you, you, you share them with them the enterprise risk management strategy. There has to be a strategy specifically for ERM. Mm. So you share with ERM. them. Enterprise risk management strategy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Starting from, pre I mean, identifying risk up, up to preparation of risk logs. Mm -hmm. uh, preparation of risk logs is also part of the the ERM strategy. So, the, the the risk champions and other officers they should also be able to keep on updating the risk log. Remember, risk is a continuous process. Mm -hmm. It doesn't end at a certain point. It's a continuous. So you have to make sure that uh, everybody is brought on, on board and also the risk champions are helping either management or the, the lower staff to, to coordinate all those activities. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, now here's a chance to talk specifically about the company you formed and to explain what it can do for organizations in terms of risk management. What, what is your experience? What specifically can you do in terms of those turnaround strategies? And managing risk at GOMS advisory services. Uh, at GOMS. 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 Yes. Yes. Uh, we provide uh, training, mm -hmm. uh, training to various organisations mm -hmm. on risk management. First of all, they have to know what is risk management. Then, if companies are willing to outsource uh, our services, we can also do the risk logs for for, for them, mm -hmm. so that they keep on managing the risks as well as increasing the likelihood of achieving the organizational objectives. Okay. How long does it take for, for your organization to turn the situation around in that regard? Yes, it depends on, on the context, but if I can say, because it's a continuous process, uh, a minimum of uh, about four to, to six months mm. uh, as, as a minimum. But if the environment is complex, it needs a, lo a lot of consultation. Uh, you can stay there for a, a period of uh, 10 to 12 months. Okay. Yes. Now, let's deal with uh, um, the term risk appetite. We hear a lot of people saying, this depends on your risk appetite. What's your risk appetite? Let's define that and then let's see how um, we can help the entrepreneur understand risk appetite. Risk appetite is whereby you determine the level of risk you are willing to take, mm -hmm. depending on your environment, also as the resources that you have. Uh, remember, you will be having scarce resources, so uh, the resources are not always adequate. So because of scarce resources, you have to prioritize. So it's the level of risk uh, the organizations are willing to take. Uh, normally, the risk appetite statement is just a broad statement that uh, describes uh, the, the risk that a particular organization is willing to take is just a broad uh, subject which generalizes uh, all the tolerance levels. Remember, we'll be having different tolerance levels. Uh, so th th that statement, it generalizes the risk that the organization is willing to take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a statement that I hear often repeated by people saying, the higher the risk, the bigger return. I don't necessarily agree with that statement. What is your take on that? Uh, that? That one, you have to be very, very cautious because let's say, for example, if you want to invest into the, the stock market, you can invest more money than you lose. But it just depends. But most of the time, uh, when you invest more money, uh, the, the, yes, there are higher chances of getting uh, more returns. But you have to calculate your risks. Mm. You have to, uh, to I calculate happen them. to believe that that statement is hogwash because it is saying to people that the only way to make a lot of money is to take a lot of risk. I beg to differ. Yes, uh, it's debatable. Uh, but you can even start small. Yes, you can even take small risk. But as you build up, mm -hmm. it becomes cumulative. Then you can be able to make more, more returns. It doesn't mean always from the start you have to start with a huge 
investment. It can start small, then keep on accumulating. During this era of COVID-19, is risk management really relevant and why? Risk management is very, very relevant. Uh, remember, this COVID-19 is the first thing <laughs> to happen to, to the world. But there have been similar, almost similar pandemics which have we heard ab about them. Like 100 the flu. years ago, yeah, the Spanish flu. Yes, but the most critical uh, during the time of COVID-19, uh, you manage, remember you have employees. These employees, uh, the <laughs> you, you have to be very, very cautious about what they do or whom they, they interact with. For example, I can give an example of decongestion. Remember, in most of the organizations, we are decongesting, uh, reducing the risk of uh, contact in mm -hmm. organizations. And also, if you put ris enterprise risk management in place, now, now that you are decongesting, you become more innovative now using the, the remember the, the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. You, you, be, you become more innovative so that you deal with uh, less stuff, but delivering the maximum output of your, your services. So it's relevant. Yes, it's yes. very, very relevant. So that, uh, for example, the highest risk that can happen uh, during uh, this COVID-19, or that have happened before, you know, our, our, our death rate regarding the, or the mortality rate regarding the, the COVID-19. Remember what, if we what have- What rate? The death rate. The, the death, the, yes, the, mm. the death rate, mm. because you know that people are, are passing on. Mm. So remember you've invested in people, trained them, have, qualifications that are familiar with uh, your job. So if that certain individual passes away, it means you have to start the recruitment process uh, afresh. Then that individual has to be familiar with him or herself with that environment. You know, some they have different ethics, some are, uh, are, are not keeping confidential information. Mm. Uh, yes, some are. Ah, it's a very... It's a very tough uh, situation where you have to, 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 to manage people. Mm. Mm. And in terms of COVID-19 uh, risk, uh, is, is, do you think that the, the coming or the use of vaccines will affect the general risk, uh, risk posture or the risk position of the country or enterprises in general? Uh, the use of vaccines, uh, yes, the health experts, they say they reduce uh, the severity or the level of, uh, I, I mean, not, not the level of contact, but they increase the chance of you uh, surviving or being resistant to, to COVID when you, your immune system is strong. Mm -hmm. So uh, as long as uh, yes, we, we, take, uh, we, we take those injections, we, we social distance, we take all the necessary procedures. So I, I think uh, that, 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 that's, that's the start. So mm -hmm. organizations should uh, implement that. Okay, Why, uh, how has COVID affected you individually or in terms of your company as well? In terms of uh, my company, uh, because of uh, the decongestion, yes, <laughs> but uh, if I uh, uh, because of the decongestion, if somebody is not uh, at, at the at, at, at the office, let's say maybe they, they contract at the office, the office is closed, the the, co the customers won't come uh, frequently, or when they come, they find out the office is closed. Uh, it means now they go to the nearest service provider. Mm -hmm. Now you are losing a customer. But in in terms of we are improving in terms of communication, so that when the customer doesn't find you. When the office closed during this COVID, they can contact uh, whoever so, is responsible for so the So has position. your bottom line been affected or are you a, a beneficiary of what people call the COVID dividend? Uh, it has been affected, but not that much because uh, we are working from home, mm. most of us. So, But if somebody needs a, a, has to be at the office, maybe it's one individual, then the next day comes another one. So we are, we are managing the situation. You worked for a long time with BMC, am I right? Yes. How many years? Uh, it's six years now. Oh, okay. It's six years. And you are still there? Yes, uh, I'm still there. Or you are leaving? I'm not sure. Yes, uh, I'm still there, but uh, 
my contract is coming to an end, so I've decided to go full time to my, my business. Okay. Mm -hmm. Working for organizations like BMC and dealing with risk in such organizations, um, are there any unique factors that have to keep in, one has to keep in mind that may not necessarily apply to smaller organizations? Yes, if you can, uh, the, it depends on the context or the, the, the environment. Uh, BMC is a big organization mm -hmm. and it, its environment. Mm -hmm. They are dealing with uh, so many processes, compliance uh, processes. Mm -hmm. So w w when you are there, you have to make sure that uh, you prioritize the most uh, critical risks that are affecting the business. Mm -hmm. For example, I can give an example of uh, supply of uh, cattle. We know that there is a constraint in the supply of cattle and the because market. Because of what? Uh, yeah. The markets are open okay. uh, uh, across the borders, so uh, the cattle numbers that uh, are being received, not only at BMC, but uh, butcheries and uh, other businesses that are not adequate. So it's a challenge because you rely on the raw material mm. for you to, to, to make profits or to break even first, then you make profits. So mm. it's quite a challenge. And there was a time when... Uh our EU contracts are also in jeopardy or problematic. That risk, has it subsided or is it still there? Because our sales were down considerably at some point. Uh, we, we are continuing to sell in, in the market. Uh, that risk uh, it, it has been mitigated. Mm. Uh, the, the, the product is still going there mm. at Europe. Okay. Mm. So the, we should not worry about that one for the foreseeable future? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And before I talk about entrepreneurs, what, what risk do you see for the bigger economy? And as an, an expert auditor, what do you think the country should do to mitigate risks, larger economic risks for, for its people? Mm, I, I think entrepreneurs uh, in, in Botswana, I think the first thing uh, is to have, uh, before you can go there, is to have an understanding of the business you, you want to do. Then after that, it also goes with passion. It goes with passion so that when you are funded, uh, you don't, you fail to manage the funds when you are funded. So also the most critical part is the, the, the market. You have to access uh, the, the, the market. You have to be sure uh, after being funded, for example, if the business is funded by by others, then you should be able to know that your product from there it goes mm -hmm. uh, s s somewhere okay. immediately. Okay. Mm. So your final advice to entrepreneurs, itself, insofar as ERM is concerned, is what? I can encourage entrepreneurs to implement uh, enterprise uh, risk management because it's focused. It, it looks forward. Mm. Uh, be before, before an event occurs uh, in the organization. So if they implement enterprise risk management, they are always alert what is likely to happen to the business. Then they manage it before mm. it happens. So it's very, very a crucial uh, subject. For example, if I can give an example, if you want to do a feedlot, uh, you, ha you have to also, as part of risk management process, you study the cost of feed. You know that it's a component also which falls under your production expenses. So you have to manage the cost of feed, uh, the, the pricing also you have to manage it. So it's, it's just a, a continuous thing. Then you keep on moti mitigating it. For example, if the cost of feed uh, goes high, maybe you can decide to produce for yourself. For example, lab lab, then you can you can produce then in care lower production costs. Then continue to manage yeah. your business. Okay. Uh, now, this is the part of the show, sir, where you have uh, an opportunity to predict the future in the sense that you look at your goals and your ambitions and you look into the crystal ball and project five to ten years or twenty years. What do you see? In terms of uh, the industry in, in general? In terms of uh, you yourself as a risk management expert and your business. Uh -huh. Uh, I'm very, very optimistic that uh, in five years to come, uh, I'll see my company 
uh, grown uh, in terms of uh, resources, in terms of clientele, because risk management is a very crucial subject. Most of the organizations are starting to implement it. So uh, it will also be a benefit to our organizations since we'll be assisting more clientele about the, the subject of risk management. Hence, helping them to achieve their objectives. Mm -hmm. yeah. So your company, where will it be five to ten years? Numbers, what is your, what is your crystal ball telling you? Yes. How because big will it be? Where, how many branches will it have? Uh, in the next five years, I, I, I project uh, it will have about five branches mm -hmm. uh, in Botswana. Then after six years, we we'll go across the border start with one, maybe in South Africa, then one, uh, Zambia, as an example. Mm. Then we want to expand locally first within the f first five years. Then after five years, then we'll go international. Uh, all the best. I wish that those dreams are realized. Okay, thank you. This is the time you can ask me a question. Uh, what I can ask is that uh, we have just started. Our company is, it has some, a few months. Uh, old, so the main challenge is to start. How how do I maneuver across the hurdles or the the obstacles as an entrepreneur when I start, especially when I don't have enough clientele when I, when I'm starting? What are strategies should I put in place to manage uh, to to make sure that my company grows as I want or as, okay. or as I project? Well, um, I think uh, there are multiple steps you can take or different approaches you can take. I would uh, strongly urge that you find yourself a mentor um, in terms of finding someone who you would like to emulate in terms of who you want to follow in your business. Maybe there is a, a, an expert auditor out there who has already been there and done that to try and align yourself with that person to see whether you can collaborate, mm. to see whether you can spend time with that person, invite them for lunch, and learn a few ideas from that person. I think mentorship is very crucial, and it's often uh, overlooked by startups. And then the second thing that you can do is to avoid chewing more than, more than I mean, biting more than you can chew. In other words, don't, don't uh, grow too fast too soon. Um, because um, the, 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 the first three or four years of any enterprise, actually I would say the first, yeah, the first three to four years is crucial. Mm -hmm. It's where 90% of enterprises collapse. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you are not conservative in your spending, but very liberal and aggressive in your hard work, you have to be both a liberal and a conservative. Liberal, hard work, uh, liberal in terms of seeking opportunities, very, very aggressive, continually seeking new opportunities, but very, very conservative with your spending. That is how, um, that is my strongest advice when you start a new enterprise. But always be, the third one, which I think is, is important, to always be uh, positive, to expect a lot of setbacks, to expect a lot of naysayers and negative energy, to expect a lot of people trying to pull you down, stabbing you in the back, not aligning with your vision, all those hurdles you have to expect and anticipate and work on the mental game so that you can overcome and persist and persevere. That's my advice. All right. What, what you mean is that uh, there's a challenge with people of, I mean, issue of people management. Yes. Uh, you need resilience to manage people. Uh -huh. Some people say it's like, sometimes it's like heading cats. Managing people is like heading cats. It's almost impossible. Okay. All right. Now you can look at that camera, sir, and leave that viewer with a word of advice, a word of wisdom, a word of encouragement. Okay. Uh, nowadays, enterprise uh, risk management uh, is a very, very crucial subject, especially we can see at the time of COVID. Uh, it's also associated with uh, business continuity both uh, enterprise risk management and business continuity management. Uh, if you don't have uh, that service or you haven't uh, acquired that service, make sure that uh, you, you invest in that service by 
soliciting uh, the assistance of a, a risk advisor in your organization so that you increase the likelihood of achieving your objectives. The other thing is that we have an upcoming conference as GOMS Advisory Services on governance, uh, risk and compliance. Uh, the, t the theme for the conference uh, is resilience, sustainability, responding to COVID-19. So this conference is very, very relevant uh, to the situation we are in. Please register. Uh, you will see the adverts on the media. Okay. Now you can share your contact details on social media, your physical address and so on, so people can reach you, including your telephone contacts. Uh, our contacts are 7522-3363 or 7255-4424. The email, services at gmail.com. Please contact us so that we can help you to manage your risk across the organization and increasing the likelihood of achieving your organizational objectives. All right. Thank you, Mr. Homolemo. Um, I'm really appreciative of your you taking your time and I appreciate the wisdom you've shared with us. You're a great guest and you, you've enriched us with your knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.